Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Robin Dorshow and I am the director of the Jewish Historical Society. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all today to our uh, second part of our three part um, program featuring women who grew up in small communities as sometimes the only Jew in the community, sometimes as part of a small community. Um, we had our first panel on this subject back in May. If you didn't get a chance to see it, you can see it on the Jewish Historical Society um, website. Uh, no, excuse me, um, YouTube channel. So again, thank you for being here. This is part two and we will have a part three in November. So it's my pleasure to introduce Elisa Karen, our wonderful and talented moderator. Elisa? Well, hey there. I am very fortunate to be able to moderate this uh, lovely group of women with so many interesting stories to share with you today. Um, and the reason that I get this privilege is because I have the opposite experience of what they're going to tell you about. I was born in New York City in the Long Island Jewish Hospital in Queens. And I made my way through many various twists and turns to the most foreign place I'd ever been to, a small town of 1,100 people called New York Mills, Minnesota. And uh, I have been in central Minnesota for about 14 years now. Um, a little bit about how I got to where I got to before we get, delve into how our panelists got there. So I was born in New York uh, to two Israelis. I was steeped in Judaism my whole life. And I went to Yale University and I got a master's degree at the London School of Economics in international development. And I'd moved around all of my childhood internationally. And uh, I thought I was an expert in culture, in navigating cultures until I got to the rural upper Midwest and I learned a thing or two about what I thought I knew. So what happened was after delving into investment banking and international development, I thought I'd choose a career that was uh, more lucrative and stable, music. Uh, and so I ended up becoming a singer songwriter. And what I learned soon was that one of the spoils of being an artist was something called artist residencies. And these are programs which allow artists to go and have time and space to create, which as an artist is an incredible boon. So within a week after hearing about this for the first time i had applied to 20 and the first one that accepted me was a place called the new york mills cultural center and arts retreat center in rural minnesota and as soon as i i got the acceptance letter i ran up the stairs to my one bedroom brooklyn apartment and had to open the atlas actually it was probably on the computer at that time so MapQuest, and look it up and i discovered that minnesota was nowhere near where i thought it was that was actually missouri and in my defense <laughs> I was uh, in New Zealand in fourth or fifth grades, fourth and fifth grades, where most kids learned US geography. So I, I didn't learn it, um, but I, I learned now where I was going to be staying for a month and then promptly took out every single guidebook on Minnesota in the New York City Public Library system. There was one. So then I added the Midwestern travel guides. And after reading a stack this high of guides, I learned that the one thing you have to do in Minnesota is to go canoe camping in the Boundary Waters Canoe Wilderness area. And since I was never coming back to Minnesota after my month that I was going to spend there, I had to do this. And so I tried to find a group canoe trip to join. But May apparently is too early in the season for canoeing, which I have learned to live with, just so you know. Um, and I had to call up the executive director of the cultural center to set up to help me find someone to lead a canoe trip. And she said, have I got the perfect guy for you? Now, I had thought I'd asked for the perfect guide, but she was setting me up with the perfect guy. So what was supposed to be a three day, two night canoe camping trip became a three day, two night blind date. And a year later, I packed up my one bedroom Brooklyn apartment into a Penske moving truck and moved all the way across the country and learned a lot about culture shock. Um, I'm going to, so what happened once I moved to Minnesota was I started specializing in writing songs about oddballs in history. And what I do these days is I perform these thematic shows that I write with stories and songs about fascinating individuals. One of my shows is called Oy Vey is Jewish for Ufta. And it features a song of mine about a woman named Rachel Kaloff, who was perhaps the original Jewish woman who moved to a small community. She came as a Russian immigrant, um, as a mail order bride. And this is her story. All right, 
to set this up for a second. And uh, here we go. A young Jewish girl in a Russian powder keg abandoned by my father and my mother was dead. Unwanted but to care for my brothers five I took another woman's passport on a one-way ride from a hard life to a new land I became a mail order bride first saw my husband on the New York dock come to take me to his North Dakota farm separate births on the endless plain we disembarked on a featureless plane hard land for a new life as a mail order bride the women sang men beat time on tin pans my mother-in-law put a flower sack over my head on my parents, brothers and wives, chickens under the bed calf in the corner, cruel cold from the cracks. A hundred winds couldn't relieve the stench. I begged the gray skies for winter to end. Hard life in a new land. Just another mail order bride. The women sang time on tin pans my mother-in-law put a flower sack over my head on my wedding day i was blind at least they couldn't see me cry new land same hard life hard land for a new life hard life in a new land as a man Well, thank you, everybody, for listening to me. And I'm going to ask our wonderful panelists to take themselves off mute if they are on it, because we are about to introduce these wonderful women. First of all, I'd like to introduce Bonnie Hoffman. Bonnie grew up as the only in the only Jewish family in Crookston, Minnesota. Thank you for waving, Bonnie. Uh, Crookston, Minnesota is 25 miles east of the North Dakota border, and once Bonnie left, she has never gone back. She is now a writer and has written everything from websites to sitcoms. Bonnie now lives in Golden Valley near the Twin Cities. Bonnie, thank you so much for being here, and I'm going to have you start our conversation with the answer to this question. What was your favorite Jewish holiday to celebrate in Crookston? In Crookston, growing up, it would have to be Hanukkah because I'm the one that got all the presents for eight days and every one of my friends got presents for only one night or one morning or some combination thereof. Um, it made me, it was really the fun, great part about being Jewish. I brought my menorah to show and tell until they probably told me to stop bringing it in fourth grade. Um, <laughs> and it, and it was great and it was it was fun thank you so much bonnie we're going to hear more from you a lot more i hope in the in the next little while i'm going to introduce you now to sally coslow sally grew up in fargo she graduated from the university of wisconsin and started a 30 plus year career in magazine journalism she is also the author of six novels the latest of which is another side of paradise about f scott fitzgerald's romance with a jewish woman named sheila graham uh, she married her college sweetheart, Sally did, not Sheila, um, and she now calls Manhattan home. Sally, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm going to ask you, what was your favorite holiday to celebrate in Fargo? The holiday I like most to celebrate in Fargo is the same one I like celebrating in New York, which is Passover. 
because uh, while in New York, it might be the harbinger of spring, it never was quite springy in, in North Dakota, but my mother made wonderful meals. And even though our family wasn't too close by, I had family in New York who I barely knew and family in the Twin Cities who that was 250 miles away. We didn't get together with them either. But many of our friends in Fargo really functioned as family and it, they were, it, was, it was always wonderful and warm. And, my mother was a great baker, sponge cakes and Passover brownies and all that sort of thing. So it was, it was a very nice holiday. That sounds great. Thank you, Sally. I'd now like to introduce Annette LaRue Zemanski. From the age of four until she went away to college at McAllister in the Twin Cities in 2003, Annette grew up on an acreage off a gravel road in Hartford, South Dakota. She's now a physician's assistant in pediatric psychiatry and lives in Shoreview, Minnesota, near the Twin Cities. Isn't that the most glorious map to give all of those of you who don't know the geography out here a bit of a sense of where everyone comes from? Annette, thank you so much for being here. Uh, what was your favorite Jewish holiday to celebrate in Hartford? I really wanted to say Passover because I love Passover, but invariably it was always somebody's birthday and I couldn't have cake or the teacher brought bagels and I couldn't have them. So I'm not going to say <laughs> Passover. Um, I actually really liked Rosh Hashanah because I got the day off from school and all my friends had to go to school and I didn't. And then we'd go out for lunch and we'd just hang out and we'd go to the mall in the afternoon and none of the other kids got to go to the mall. So it was great. We'd do services in the morning. So. Oh, that sounds great. And then I'm going to have to ask you for your advice because Rosh Hashanah is the first day of school this year, which is a little complicated. Yeah. So we actually advocated to the school board and got them to change the first day of school for okay. my kids district, you because are... I have a seventh grader, a fifth grader and a kindergartner. And I normally would say, okay, just miss a day of school, but the first day of kindergarten is kind of a big deal. So we were able to advocate and I I understand a few other schools in the Twin Cities have also elected to move the first day of school. But as a kid, this happened and we just had to choose. Did we go to the first day of school or did we skip it? And the school was not super accommodating. <laughs> I can imagine. Thank you so much, Annette. Yeah. Okay, finally, our fourth panelist. Beryl A. Radin is a public and social policy expert, professor, consultant, and author who lives in Washington, D.C. She grew up in Aberdeen, South Dakota, and left, and the title of her memoir encapsulates why? Leaving South Dakota, a memoir of a Jewish feminist academic. Beryl has published more than a dozen books and many, many articles. Beryl, thank you for being here. What was your favorite Jewish holiday to celebrate in Aberdeen? Uh I think I'm going to answer that in a slightly different way than, than my three predecessors did. I'm going to answer it as somebody who always has felt that she had a foot in two camps, in two worlds, both the Jewish world and in the world that she was living in. So I, I'm going to talk about three different holidays quickly. <laughs> and um, the first one was is it was the Seder and and for in, in my family we often went to relatives either in Minneapolis or St. Paul or to the other side of the family in Milwaukee or Madison and we went to this one year we went to my aunt Rose's in Madison she kept kosher she was the only one that kept kosher but she believed that children needed to drink milk at every meal so she folded the tablecloth and put the milk on the part without a cloth. She said, therefore, it was two different tables, milk and one and everything else on the other. And it was a very interesting interpretation of kosher. Now, my second example happened in at Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur in Aberdeen. Uh, the, ser the services that were held in the small synagogue in Aberdeen brought some Jewish people from small towns in the area. And usually there were kids my age who turned up with their, their families and they were welcomed. And I particularly welcomed them because there was only one person my age in Aberdeen one year older and one year younger. So you not only got dressed up, but you invited them to come back to your house after the services. So I always had popular music songs available uh, to play on the piano and we all sang along. 
And I thought it was kind of like a preview of what happened when people went to Herzl camp from different places at the same time. And then finally, my examples about Hanukkah, that usually Hanukkah comes before Christmas. And we had neighbors who lived across the alley from us who were from Sweden, and they invited us over for Christmas Eve. And they, they were known for their incredible food. So my mother told us to rewrap our Hanukkah presents <laughs> once every night and put them under the neighbor's tree. And then therefore we participated in the opening ceremony acknowledging our two worlds. <laughs> That's fabulous. I love the creativity of how to bring these two worlds kind of side by side, but also together. So for, for the children that are living in both. All right, I'm gonna open up the floor. We're gonna now have this, we're gonna now have some fun. Not that we haven't already. I thought those answers were wonderful. Um, but I wanted to invite each of you to tell us a bit about your story and specifically how growing up in a small Jewish community, potentially isolated from other Jewish people, affected or created your sense of Jewish identity. And um, we'll go in order that we just went. Let's, let's start with Bonnie. All right, I'll just give you a quick background. Um, years, years ago, generations ago, many Jewish people came into the United States through Canada and they went along the Canadian border and they settled in these towns in Crookston, Aberdeen, Grand Forks. Um, my family was from Crookston. Um, there were, my father was born and raised there. He met my mother while at law school at the University of Minnesota. She was from St. Paul. They got married and he moved to Crookston. And as she tells the story, I told him I would follow him to the ends of the earth and he took me there. And Crook, Crookston was sort of the end of the earth. It was a small town. We were the only Jewish family. My best friend's father was the minister at the Missouri Synod uh, Trinity Lutheran Church. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that, okay. And um, so I had uh, a sense of being the other because I was, I had no one to celebrate a holiday with. I had no peers to um, have the same days off of school. They would be with their families at Christmas and we would wait for Christmas to be over. Uh, we would wait for, e I would call my friend and say, is Easter over yet? Can I come over? Because I didn't know when, when these holidays ended, when it was like regular time again. Um, but I, w I knew I was different and I felt a pressure of uh, behaving in such a way, grades in such a way that, because I re represented all that these people knew in like in my high school of who is a Jew, what is a Jew, and I represented a people. And it, it felt like a lot of pressure. I came back to my first high school reunion and someone actually said, you know, I've met other Jews since I left Crookston as if I was the only one. Um, but I just want to show you a clipping. You tell me what's wrong with this headline. My parents went to Israel and the local newspaper did a story. Israel, a city steeped in history. <laughs> oh my gosh. There are more like that. But anyway, so it was, <laughs> it was unusual. It was great. I was glad to leave. I still have very, very dear friends from high school. We travel together. We see each other. Um, but I haven't been back. and there aren't any family members left. Thank you, Bonnie. That's a very unique experience to the people who have, have had that only Jew in a small town. And I certainly share that pressure of being when you're the only person to represent an entire culture, which is completely unfair, but what happens? All right, who is next? Sally, let's go to you, Sally. Okay. Well, we compared to Crookston had a large Jewish community in Fargo. I was one of eight kids my own age. And we're, I'm really still in touch with all of them. But I led a very bifurcated life because it was a very positive experience to be Jewish in Fargo. Um, and if my husband would stop doing that, I'd be very grateful, <laughs> teasing me. Um, my father was from New York and um, he visited an uncle who had settled in North Dakota to be a cattle trader my uncle, great uncle Jake. So he made an intermediary stop for 45 years in Fargo because he wound oh up really God. liking it. And um, when he was maybe, I don't know, 25, 26, he went to somebody's lake home in Minnesota, their popular thing here. 
um, here in, um, in the Dakotas to people to have lake cottages. And he met my mother who had just graduated from the University of Minnesota. Um, she was from St. Paul. And a year later, they got married and moved to Fargo. And uh, they had, my, my parents chose to have mostly Jewish friends, even though they could have socialized with many people who were uh, not Jewish in town. They limited themselves, but it was, there were enough people for them to have a big social life. Um, I liked very much living in Fargo, but as I got older, I got more curious about what it would be like to have more Jewish friends. And I, I love going to Herzl Camp and I love going to B'nai B'rith with BBYO, that, those sorts of events. And I believe I was um, the sweetheart of North Dakota. There wasn't a lot of competition. I did get to have a TR for a year. Uh, and then I, I went to the University of Wisconsin in Madison, which my parents basically picked out for me because it had an enormous number of, um, of Jewish students, um, one of whom I married. Um, many, many years ago in my synagogue um, at Temple Bethel in Fargo. Uh, and when I, when I wrote my first novel, uh, which was called Little Pink Slips, and it was about um, an editor of a large mass market magazine, my editor said, uh, I love this book, it's gonna leave very little editing, but the only thing I really couldn't buy was that the editor of this big magazine was a Jewish girl from Fargo, North Dakota. And I said, well, that's one thing I'm not going to change because that was purely autobiographical. Um, I always felt that it was a wonderful thing for me to have been raised in, in Fargo because professionally it helped me understand this audience. But more than that, I had wonderful friends in Fargo, both Jewish and non-Jewish. And I'm still in touch with a great many of them. So overall, it was a it was a plus for me to have this experience. Thank you so much, Sally. And I have to say that I love Temple Bethel. It is such a lovely gem of a synagogue, and I really it, enjoy it. It's there. a very different um, congregation than when I was there because yeah, at, at, at the peak of our time, we had 85 Jewish kids in the religious school, and now most most of our parents urged us to leave the community, and we did, uh, unless a, a few young men were invited into their family businesses. I don't recall any young women being invited into those businesses, and the rest of us left Fargo as if it had been some cosmic mistake that we were ever there. <laughs> so there's a, much, a, a small synagogue, there's a small congregation there now, different people. Yeah, a lot of visiting, the medical and the uh, college professors. Yes, kind of we were always enriched by those two strains yeah. of Jewish community people. I'm gonna, before I move to Annette, um, I just wanna say I'm seeing little chats, uh, people are, are writing into the chat and I am not going to be monitoring chat, but if you have questions that we will address later at the end of our general panel conversations, please put them into the Q&A, which you'll see in the bottom of your Zoom screen. And if you wanna direct them to a specific panelist, make sure you write their name in there so we can do that. Um, on the chat, you're welcome to chat with each other, but we will not be seeing that during this conversation. Okay, Annette, your turn. Well, and I think it was, it's interesting to think about this because I grew up in an interfaith household as well as a only Jew type situation in the community that I was living in. Um, so my father was not Jewish and he was the one from South Dakota, which is where I grew up um, and really didn't participate in Judaism at all. And my mother, who may be among the participants here, um, kind of drove the the connection to Judaism. So if we had a connection with the synagogue and we did with the one in Sioux Falls, it was because my mother made sure that it happened. If we celebrated holidays, it was because my mother made sure that it happened. Um, and so I had this experience of, you know, I graduated in a class of 63 kids from three different towns and I was the only Jew and kids sort of knew that because I'd skip school sometimes for things they didn't really understand. Um, but it was sort of a separate identity from growing up in that town. Now, there were things that I think my parents experienced. My mother told me a story about how when they moved there when I was four, she was invited to go to church with all of the neighboring farm ladies, and she kept declining, and they thought she was really stuck up, and why wouldn't she go to their nice Lutheran church? Um, and <laughs> just didn't understand that that didn't fit with our belief system. Um, so 
you know, I had positive Jewish experiences, but they were very separated from my day-to-day -day going to school, developing friendship experiences. We did have a little bit of a religious school, I think more than there is now actually at the Mount Zion in Sioux Falls. Um, but there were maybe two or three other kids my age, which is not just where I grew up. So it drew from basically all of Eastern South Dakota outside of Aberdeen. And I don't know that Aberdeen synagogue was functional by the time I was growing up. Um, so they weren't people I could easily get together with outside of, okay, we'll come on Sunday and do Sunday school or, okay, we're coming for services. Um, my mom had a close friend who was Jewish in town, in town being Sioux Falls, um, but her kids were older than I was. So I didn't develop a lot of those relationships. Um, and when I went to camp, because I did go to Herzl also, and I loved it, I didn't know anybody going in and so many other people did that I didn't feel like I connected as deeply as some of them maybe did. Um, I did join youth group in high school. My mother, again, made sure it happened because we didn't have a youth group and we affiliated with Nifty um, and sort of barged our way in <laughs> and they were happy to have us, but it, it was very much, we're forming a space for ourselves here. So I guess that's my experience there. It, it is it is a lot on the shoulders of one parent in an interfaith household when there isn't a community to, to build that yeah. identity. So I, clearly your mother succeeded, so good for her. Thanks, mom. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Michael. <laughs> uh, why don't you take your, your turn? Um, I think I'd, I'd like to start with the, by noting that of the four of us, I'm the oldest. And and uh, and I actually represent a little bit different of a, a generation, and partially that started that both of my parents came to the United States. My mother was only I think two or three when she came, and my father was twelve. But so so where? They, huh? from they, where no. they came from Belarus, and the my mother's family was a, a rabbinical family and the, um, my, my, my grandfather, um, her, her father was not, was someone uh, who was the second son and in rabbinical families, the second son did not inherit the rabbinate. So he needed to find a job and he, um, he, he, he was, he had spent his life, you know, uh, in, in training to be a rabbi, but he was not going to be a rabbi. It, it seemed that that was inevitable. So he found out that the, um, the Hebrew school, the Cheder, and St. Paul was looking for a head and he applied for it. And so there were, at that point, uh, there were two children and, and two adults. Um, and so they came to St. Paul and, and my grandfather became the head of the Talmud Torah in, in St. Paul. Um, so they, are, they, they, they came to the United States and they came straight to Minnesota. Um, my father's family was, it did not live in the shtetl, which is which my mother's family did. But they, my grandfather had a a a business that was on the edge of the shtetl. But and he he his customers were were both people who who spoke both Russian and Polish, and so he was really kind of more acclimated to a, a broader society. And he, but he realized both he and his and my grandmother lost two children because there was no medical treatment available. And so they decided they had to come to the US. And I, and I don't, nobody's ever been able to tell me the story, but somehow my, that grandfather who had, had run a business went to school to become a shachid. And so he applied for a job as a butcher, as a kosher butcher um, in Milwaukee. And that's where they came. So I had 
these families that were both from the Midwest, so they, they jumped over half of the United States to come to the Midwest, which was already unusual. And then it turned out after my father was, um, was actually working for Investors Diversified Services, which some of you remember from Minneapolis. Um, um, and, um, and he met my mother who had been working for 10 years in New York City. And, and she was back home for, for some family reasons. And, and they met at uh, my, my uncle's house in Minneapolis. My uncle was a lawyer in Minneapolis. So that's how they met. And when the, the funniest story though, was when, when my father told my grandmother, because my, my gr grandfather had died, that he had met somebody that he wanted to marry. So they, they, they drove to Milwaukee and, and, and discovered that my grandmother on my father's side, when she was a young girl, had gone for advice from my great grandfather, the rabbi in, in Rupsevich, which is the, the town that came from. So, I mean, the whole thing was really bizarre. And so, and remember, I, I was born during the depression. So this life was very hard for a lot of people. And, and, and my father got a job with Investors Diversified Services as a divisional manager in North and South Dakota, met my mother and within months they were married and on their way to Aberdeen. Hmm. And, and I keep, you know, I've always thought about, she had spent 10 years in New York City and, and, and going, even though she grew up in, in St. Paul, but, but she also had a father who didn't like the fact that she was a sculptor and he destroyed her images of the, her graven images. Oh. And, and, he, and he was just this lovely, Old oh, man, I could never figure that out. So anyway, they're in they're in Aberdeen, and and I, in in my uh, memoir, I start out the the chapter on Aberdeen, thinking about my mother dri driving with my father on Route Twelve in, in Aberdeen, and what she must have thought of what was going on. But that's that's where I, I started out. Well, Beryl, I, I, you just gave me a nice leaping off point to the next question I had, which um, one of you actually suggested, and I apologize, I, I don't remember who had this observation that three out of the four of you have a story within the generations of your family of a woman, no, all four of you, of a woman moving for a man to some very geographically distant place. Certainly Bonnie has that story. And I think all everyone does. So, so I'm very curious as to what, why is there this theme that the woman is the one who moves and the man is the one who's so attached to his geographic roots, he's not willing to go. I think it was because the man was usually the breadwinner. And it was, and, it was the, and it was the job that really defined what was possible. My mother was a social worker when she graduated from U of M. She worked for a year. She, that was the year she met my dad. And um, it, was, it was a time when women traditionally didn't work. So he was the one who brought home the bacon, if I can be so suggestive. My mother also had a college degree, but never uh, worked when we lived in Crookston. But another commonality, Elisa, is that um, the women also took ownership of the Jewish education. And I just wanted to add that um, we didn't have a Sunday school or a Hebrew school that we were participating in. So my mother was the Sunday school. Rabbi Shapiro of Temple Israel in Minneapolis would mail us books and she would literally give us lessons. And it was like, no, you can't go out in the snowmobile until you tell me all about Abraham. It literally was like that until I was 16 years old and flown to Temple Israel to be confirmed. Um, so I think even if they weren't working, this was a full-time job trying to have Jewish holidays, uh, raise a Jewish family, and, and keep those traditions alive in home, especially when they were in the minority. 
actually, just to add on to, to the observation is that um, when I was 10 years old, my father died. Mm -hmm. And so my mother really was the person in charge in the family. And she and stayed in Aberdeen? The day of the funeral, my brother and I sat down with my mother and asked her to please not move away from Aberdeen. And she promised. She stayed and we left. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, it, it, and I know your story, your mother and I need to talk, I think. Yeah, so, <laughs> well, it's interesting because, so my father was from South Dakota, my mother's from New York, and my mother, after college, got a teaching job in South Dakota, which is how my parents met. The reason I wasn't born in South Dakota is because my grandparents, who are still living in New York, my mother wanted to be closer to her parents, so the compromise was they moved to Vermont, and they were there until I was four, my brother was born in Vermont, and my father hated it and ultimately said, I'm going back to South Dakota. Are you coming with me or not? And we all, in 1989, went back to South Dakota. Now, I, Beryl, you had commented you're the oldest. I am the youngest on this panel, right? So I have the opposite end of experience here. Um, so my mother did work outside the home, maybe not when I was really little, um, but certainly by the time I was in school, she was doing some work and, and helping my dad with his work. Um, so it, it wasn't so much that it was, for my dad's job is that he really loved South Dakota. Um, and so that was how we ended up back in South Dakota. That's why we didn't live in Sioux Falls because my dad did not want to live in town. He grew up in a farming family and wanted to have something of that experience, even though both of my parents did drive into Sioux Falls for work. On the so. other hand, my mother craved anything Jewish. We would come down to visit my grandmother, her mother who lived in St. Paul and my father's parents lived in Crookston and we would buy, and I literally cases of bagels. We had a separate freezer just for <laughs> bagels and it wasn't bagel till, <laughs> till I went to college and I tasted a bagel without freezer burn. Oh um, but <laughs> so there was, there was a real desire to bring anything Jewish into the home. Um, Alyssa, uh, it, was, it wasn't available. I, if I can jump in, I think that the culinary aspect of living in a small community often focused on bringing a lot of food home, not just for your own enormous coffin-like freezer, but for your friends and relatives and um, it, corned beef and pastrami and, and, and bagels. And when my husband who's from New York visited me the first time when we, we drove from Fargo to Minneapolis and I said, oh, we have to go to this great deli, you know, the, the Lincoln Dell was a big thing at the time. And he was very underwhelmed. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I thought it was great. We went there every time we went up to Herzl. Yes, it wasn't I so special if you, if you grew up in right. Long Island. No. I never been been was this place? Is it still existing? It doesn't. It's oh, gone yeah. now. It was in the Twin Cities because we would stop there on the way up to summer camp. We'd drive up the four hour drive to the Twin Cities. We'd stop for lunch and then get on the bus to go to Herzl. And we'd stop there every time. But it's, mm -hmm. it's gone now, unfortunately. I never went to Herzl, but Rabbi Shapiro encouraged my mother to send me to a camp that was associated at the time with the JCC, which no longer exists, called Camp Tikva. And it was the first time that I had really socially been with other Jewish youth. And it, it was unusual. I, I felt different because I didn't have those connections, those sort of like, we went to high school together, we went to this together, we grew up to, you were in the same neighborhood. You know, even there I felt on the outside, except it's amazing how clearly you remember the people who were kind and embracing and those that sort of ignored you or even worse. So it's, um, it, it, made, it made an impact. I, I not only went to Herzl, that I became a counselor at Herzl after a year at Antioch. Talk about different worlds, you know. And so that that was just incredible. But I always I felt that 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 being at Herzl really underlined so many things that I was feeling but couldn't articulate. Well, I I loved Herzl, and I was a I was there at it's like being a CIT. Um, but when I went to the University of Wisconsin, somebody steered me toward a dorm that had a lot of Jewish girls in it. And I remember the first day over the loudspeaker, they were 
paging Minnie Tannenbaum and Isabel Slatnik. And I thought, oh my God, where have I, you know, I, I <laughs> in my high school of Linda's and Carol's and, you know, Patty's and Susan's. I thought, <laughs> I, and I thought everyone would be very excited to meet me because I was Jewish. Because that was what it was like to be Jewish from a small town. I mean, when my parents would go to dental conventions, that was my father's business. Um, they would spot a Jew from 2000 miles away in a, in a gala. Um, but I, I quickly learned in a school full of Jewish kids, I'm talking about Wisconsin now, Madison, Wisconsin, um, from the North shore of Chicago and from Long Island and from Washington, that it wasn't really quite as special to be to, find, to meet another Jew as it was for me. Although I would piggyback on that really, really quickly that when I would go to places like that and then say I was from South Dakota, that, that was the exceptional part, right? Yeah. Well, so not that I was Jewish, Jewish anymore, Jewish, but that I was Jewish and I was from South Dakota. People my whole life have been saying, you're the first person I've ever met from North Dakota. But that was quite a part. And then when they find out I'm Jewish, it blows their minds. I, I actually at Antioch had a friend and he was convinced that I was just making it up for the whole time mm -hmm. we were both in, at Antioch. <laughs> but I was from South Dakota. He said, you've got a big mouth. You, you're interested in politics. There's no way that you're not from Brooklyn. <laughs> I got that too. People would always <laughs> say to me, are you from New York? And I go, no, I'm from a little farm town in the heart of the Red River Valley. And they go, no, you're not. And I go, yeah, I am. I'm just from this little farm town. There is something about New York City and Jewishness that, that where people who aren't Jewish and people from New York, like it becomes very Jewish-like. I have a yeah, who are very Jewish. <laughs> but from New York. When, <laughs> when I moved to New York, I was a little disappointed to hear the conversation among adults, people I didn't think of myself quite as an adult at the time, uh, because they're, they seem to have much more provincial conversation than I felt my parents and their friends had. Because if you live in a place like Fargo, you know you're not the center of the universe. You yeah. make it your business to find out what's going on in Israel, for example. And, and conversation is not only about the country club. So um, I, I, I think that there was a certain level of sophistication among my parents' friends in terms of studying up. Sally, and I really appreciate that you mentioned that because uh, that is one of the, the opportunities that people have when they grow up or live in a place that is so far from the centers of commerce and media. You really do take the, the, the extra steps to learn those things. And, and I also got a pretty decent Jewish education in Fargo. We did have a big enough synagogue to have a religious school. Um, and there were always people who were at one of three colleges in the community in Fargo and Moorhead who were available to teach. And um, my, my sister and brother, we, we all married Jews as it turned out. Um, my sister is a very well-known calligrapher Jewish calligrapher, and she's married to a very prominent rabbi that had, used to be the head of the Reconstructionist Movement's yeshiva, um, well, then you call it yeshiva, the, the rabbinical college. And, and my brother married a woman from Israel where he lives. So um, something, something clicked in terms of yeah, telling us with the Jewish wait, identity. I, I just have to tell the story. When I came to, the first day I came to Antioch and I was in my hall and People who were in that hall still remember this. I mean, they remind me of it every time I see them. I walked down the hallway and looked at names and started counting the Jewish names that were, um, and there were, you know, the, of course there was nobody else from South Dakota, but there were mostly people from Philadelphia, from New York, um, there was a, a, a person of color from Kentucky, so she and I were roommates, which we always thought we had kind of similar stories to tell. But but they 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 said that they had never thought of anybody who would be able to to count Jews as something unusual. Exactly. Well, now you talked about opportunity, Elisa. Another opportunity of living in a town like Crooks and, and these towns with a Jewish mother is that 
they bring Judaism to the community in a sense that they may do a mock Passover Seder at the church. They may speak to a youth group. We had Christmas Eve at a minister's family that we were friends with. We had Ludafisk for the first time. And that's what we had in my place. <laughs> and he and his family came, you know, to our house for a Passover Seder. So it, and it, it's not assimilation. It's really just a sharing and it's invitation. Changed. It's, it's an, an exchange. Yes. My, my local uh, Lutheran pastor and I, and my family, we would share, he was the only other, you know, Jewish aware person. And so yes. he would come over for Passover and all of those things. Yeah. yeah. I would say I was probably featured at least once in the newspaper and at least once on the local news around some holiday of like, oh yeah, it's Christmas time, but hey, we found this Jewish family with kids. <laughs> Let them light the menorah on TV. Uh, well, so. One headline in the Crookston Daily Times, or being Jewish must have been news. It literally said, Jewish family celebrates Hanukkah, but sends holiday cards or something like uh. that. You know, because we sent a generic picture card like everybody did back in the 60s. And it was like, oh, they're Jews and they're sending holiday cards, you know, basically. I love that the newspaper had to find like a way to link a similarity there. They had a nose for news or a nose for Jews, one of the two. <laughs> Actually, my, 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 my favorite story that I will never forget, it came when I was seven years old in second grade. And I had this friend and I took some reason I told him I was Jewish that something came up and he sit, looks at me and he says, you can't be Jewish. And, and I said, why not? I am Jewish. And he said, in my house, we have a lot of Bible story books and in every, and there are a lot of Jewish people in those Bible stories. And every one of those people was wearing a robe. <laughs> and, and you can't be Jewish because you don't wear a robe. Yes. I mean, I, I will never forget. <laughs> I went to Girl State, which was part of the American Legion. Uh, Bill Clinton went to Boy State. I went to Girl State. Yeah, and, um, <laughs> and my roommate from some tiny, tiny dot in the map in North Dakota actually asked me to show my horns. I, I always wondered we had if a horn were... incident. We had a horn incident. Someone knocked on our door and we opened the door and they said, you're Jewish, aren't you? And we said, yes. You know, I think it was my mother and I answered the door. Well, where are your horns? Like it was something we put on when we wanted to. We don't have horns. We had a that, horn. That was a, that was a very outlier kind of an experience. It was, it but... was. It and was. I mean, mine too. It was, yeah, but it was, it was in all that anti-Semitic literature that it was, you know. That, there was a very warm embrace, I felt, in the community where I lived. And um, this was an outlier. But, thing, but, it's but, but the Jews did, the Jewish community did set itself apart to a certain degree by choice. And um, you, like in small towns in the South or anywhere else in the United States, most of the stores had Jewish last names as Seals and Strauss and um, pre Mac it was, and Pred. <laughs> it, it, was, it, it was difficult, but but my mother had a good sense of humor, and she used to joke, and she would say, "Nobody ever gets me mixed up with Mrs. Anderson. You might get me mixed up with Betty Fetter, but you know, not not with Mrs. Anderson." People people knew, even though there wasn't a, it wasn't negative. People definitely knew who the Jews were. Okay. I, I, always, I, always, I always thought it was really, I, I could never figure out what to say about when people ask me about the presence of anti-Semitism. And because there, there were silly stories, but then there was also the synagogue, uh, the former church that, that was the synagogue in Aberdeen was, One a, block Falls away, too. <laughs> was a block away from uh, the, the second Catholic church, there were two Catholic churches in Aberdeen. One was from the lace curtain, the Catholics, and the other was from uh, actually Catholics who had been originally from Germany and then went to Russia after the Reformation to become wheat farmers and then they came to South Dakota. And, and so the, it was the latter one. And so I, it was, you know, in South Dakota, and in most of our, 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 our areas, 
at three o'clock in the afternoon, it's dark in the winter, right? So, so I'd have to, after Hebrew school, I'd have to go leave and walk out. And sometimes it was a little scary because these kids would come running, you know, from the, from the church. And, 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 and what, what I, they would yell at me, you kill Christ. Oh. Ooh. And, and, and I, I didn't know what to say. And then I finally figured out what I was going to say. And it says, I wasn't even there. <laughs> Great answer. <laughs> okay, I, I wanted, there's an interesting parallel here that you guys have noticed, um, that our panelists have noticed, which is that three out of the four panelists turned into writers, and I'm also a writer. Um, and Annette's our odd woman out, but we're gonna, we're gonna address this question and a version of it to her at the end of this one. Which So I'm wondering, is there any part of this kind of being an, an isolated member of a culture surrounded by people who are different from you that lends itself to becoming writers? What would you guys say? Let's start with uh, with Bonnie. Maybe it's voice um, because you come from a certain belief system or I'm just making this up, but maybe it is, uh, you know, about voice. Um, you have a different voice or I, I used humor to sort of as a defense, you know, being Jewish um, in a way. And my first uh, ex understanding of Jewish culture was watching comedians on Ed Sullivan, like old comedians. It was like, oh, so this is Jewish. This, so I would listen and I liked the way they wrote and I started writing and I started writing in, um, I wrote news, I worked in television, I worked for companies, I worked for you know, Target, I wrote sitcom, a sitcom where I didn't write, I was a staff writer and for a sitcom on ABC and I've been published in, you know, humor pieces and stuff. So I think it's that sort of sensibility of a voice that I sort of internalized somehow. Now, granted, when I'm writing for Target, I don't try to be funny Jewish, but um, it sometimes, it, I feel it is, it could be a voice thing. Thank you, Bonnie. Sally. Well, I don't think this is a small town thing. I think this is just a Jewish thing. Um, my sister and brother both write very well. And, and um, we have my sister's published a book, two books, and my brother writes a column in Los Angeles in his area, which is city planning. And um, I, I moved to New York because I wanted to work on a magazine, and that's where magazines were. There aren't too many magazines anymore, but I worked at Mademoiselle magazine. And then later on, I established a second career in um, writing fiction for the most part. I've written, you know, hundreds of articles. It's just, I mean, I'm kind of an idiot savant that I do this one thing, writing, you know, <laughs> and that don't ask me to, you know, don't ask me to be a computer programmer, please. So um, I don't think it's a small town thing. Um, I think my, my grandmother in St. Paul was a wonderful writer and writer of letters mostly, but you know, when I would visit her, there was the Atlantic magazine on her table. So it was, and it was just part of our DNA, but not a small town thing, I don't think. I wasn't saying small town, I'm saying isolated community. Isolated community, well, uh, maybe. I have to think Sally, about it. Sally, did you write in school, like for the newspaper? I was or the editor of the newspaper. Exactly, yeah. me yeah. too. I mean, I was an editor, but same it's thing. Interesting. But, I think that both answers are, 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 are valid. I mean, one is the using the humor as a defense because mm -hmm. it needs you to become a humorist. And one is, this is just part of who you were, a writer. And maybe Judaism has something to do with it. I, I, I have a crazy, Girl. okay, yeah. I have a crazy story, okay. Um, my, my mother had, when she lived in New York, had purchased a, a very early uh, typewriter, portable typewriter. And in the letters that I found when I was started to write this, this memoir, the, most of them were typed. And, and she would always say, um, that to my father, is it okay that I type these letters? Some people don't like typing, but 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 I I like to write, and so I had this thing about I wanted a typewriter, 
And I received a typewriter from one of my aunts on my brother's bar mitzvah. <laughs> because they knew I, I, I was resenting that I was older, but I didn't have a bat mitzvah. I just had a I don't know what I had, but, um, but, but anyway, so I got this typewriter and, but I, and I learned to type really fast because I wanted to be able to, to, to type what I was thinking. Um, and, and so I never went anywhere without my typewriter and, and, and I, and I've now transferred it to, to Max. <laughs> So that, that I have, you know, there's, there's something that I really care about and it's, it's, it's an expression. And, it, but I also think, you know, that writing is something that comes with people who really spend a lot of time worrying about education and learning. So it's, it's, not, it's not really, you know, some kind of magic potion. <laughs> Well, thank you, Beryl. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slant this question for Annette right now, because when you think that you about the fact that you went into pediatric psychiatry, it's a very interesting question as to how your Jewish experience in a small community might have affected that. Well, and, you know, my professional career hasn't been exclusively in pediatric psychiatry because the PA profession allows for some lateral flexibility. I started in family medicine, which I did for about three years before I transferred over to psychiatry and then narrowed further to pediatric psychiatry. Um, I don't really know how the two relate, to be perfectly honest. And I'm to some degree, I'm somewhat of an outlier in my family in that I'm in medicine. Um, my mother was a teacher and in currently works for the Children's Defense Fund, so does cool stuff like that. My brother works for the Library Foundation of Los Angeles, where he lives. So I'm sort of the outlier, and I don't really know how to relate, to be honest. No <laughs> it's a cool thing that you're doing, whether it relates or not. <laughs> um, okay, we are, we are having the most incredible conversation that we haven't even touched on most of my questions, which is great. It means that we're doing, the conversation is flowing so well. Um, I do want to bring up, I'm seeing some questions in the chat. How do people participate? We are about in a few moments going to open up the Q&A. So if you would like to participate or ask questions to our panelists, please go into the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen and you can address a question and you can address it to a specific panelist as well. Uh, and I'm going to ask one final question, and then we're going to close. We're going to we're going to close our general conversation and open it to Q and A. And my final question, and we've got three minutes for the four of you. So short answers um, is: What wisdom or joyful memory do you have to offer from, uh, or that that offers is something that is offered to you? as a memory that you hold dear to yourself that you can share with everyone about oh last i need to about being in a jewish community and about a, being in a small jewish community well, oh I sorry, got a sign go sally do it i had a lovely wedding on december 26 which was insane in fargo north dakota because it was about four below zero but it was my basically it was my mother's wedding because brides way back when had hardly anything to say about their weddings, their mothers did it, but um, it was it was lovely. And the uh, people who came from New York will never forget it. They said their eyelashes froze when they got off the plane. Um, so that for me is Thank it. Thank you, Sally, that was a beautiful right, image. Now I thought of something. Bonnie. Um, I would say it's all the ritual, the, the ritual that um, I had growing up with Passover and the high holidays that those really stayed with me and then continued. I have two grown children. And as they were growing up, we did all those rituals. My daughter just got married, Mazel Tov, Sarah. And we did all of those rituals in her wedding. And uh, that's the part you asked about holidays. That's the part I really love the most are those, those rituals. Thank you so much, Bonnie. Beryl. Um, I think it was, um, the fact that most of the Jewish community that, that, um, that was around when I was growing up were people that I called aunt and uncle. I had plenty of aunts and uncles by birth, but but there there was a family relationship that really extended beyond um, what, what you would really expect. I, the, the person who was a year younger than I was, 
is a, is a lawyer in, in, in Los Angeles and we're in touch. I mean, I haven't seen him for about 20 years, but, but you know, if anybody finds out something that the other person should know, they, they send, you know, and it, it was, it, it's like it's, it's extended your family in a way that was really interesting. Thank you so much, Beryl. Annette. Well, I had a specific memory that struck me that I wanted to share, and I think that it lended itself to the inclusivity and flexibility. So my father, who was not Jewish, was a poet, and I did have a bat mitzvah. So for my bat mitzvah, he didn't know any Hebrew, he didn't know any prayers. So he wrote me a poem that he read for my bat mitzvah that I still have somewhere. Um, and just finding ways to, to make all of this work and to include everyone, right? So he wrote one for me. I think he wrote one for my brother as well. Um, that we were able to include in that service as, as part of that celebration, so. Well, thank you. First, I wanna thank all our panelists for their time and attention to this conversation. It has been such a treat to hear your stories. And what a wonderful closing description you've just given to some of the beauties of having grown up in these small communities of Jews and being surrounded by people who weren't Jewish, but have you know, we're part of your community. Um, I wanna also thank all of you who are out there who took the time to listen into our conversation. We're not completely ending, we're now gonna open up to Q&A, uh, but before we do that, I just also wanna remind anyone who's interested, we're gonna have an, another panel, of the third in the three-part series, and there will be five panelists and we'll be addressing similar questions and points with also very interesting stories. So hope to see you there. And let me, well, I'm going to have to find my Q&A box. All right, let's get started. Joyce Lipinski asked, were there other Jewish families for you to connect with in your immediate area and town? And I know for all of you, it's a little bit different. Let's start with Bonnie. Um, there was a family in Grand Forks that um, we would see occasionally. And then the um, family I mentioned to you, Sally and Fargo, the brides, is that right? So we would That's see them. Right. Yes, we would see them occasionally. So there, there were families in that area, a few. Sally? Many. Many. It was like uh, Beryl just said, aunt and uncle, you know, was, was an a honorary title in certain cases. And um, I feel as if the other Jewish kids, um, more or less my age, that were all like cousins. And because of Facebook, we've established, I think we could, somebody named it the Frozen Chosen. Uh, Marilyn Chiat. Uh, and um, there's always been talk of a reunion, but nobody uh, seems to want to be the person to get it together. But there, there were plenty of people who um, yeah. uh, functioned in my life in a warm capacity. And Beryl, you had a similar experience to Sally? Uh, yeah, I, I, there also were people in, the, there were actually some cousins that we, d we were discovered in the process. The, the Preds, for example, um, they had family in Colorado, but then they had this great store in, in Aberdeen. Uh, and, and they were sort of third cousins related. And so, so it's it's just that you discovered. Uh, one of the things that that uh, I was always really interested in was the music, and we haven't gotten to any of this, but the music in the synagogue about where the tunes came from, because almost everybody around there were lit fox, and um, and and that you had different tunes, you had different pronunciations. Um, and yet, and and yet, that was something that that you, you really took pleasure in. <laughs> Annette. Well, it was. It depends on how big your net is, right? So, in my school, nobody in the town of Hertford or Crooks or Colton, the other schools in my school district, nobody that I was aware of. Um, Sioux Falls had a synagogue that had. I think maybe up to 50 or so Jewish families, but it drew from a pretty large geographical area. So you could go into Sioux Falls and not that it was that far away. It was probably half hour drive, but I didn't do it for more than some of the celebration stuff. And then there was the Sunday school. So I guess I didn't, you know, when I was getting together with friends, I didn't 
get together with a lot of Jewish friends outside of facilitated activities and then youth group in high school. Thank you, Annette. Okay, our next question is from Missy Hermes. Hi, Missy. The story of being the only Jewish family in a rural in a rural West Central Minnesota town is so very common. Do you think this happened naturally, or is there a feeling that one single family is all that a community would accept? And let me just say personally, I wish that I could interact with all of those families and they could all come together because that would make it a much easier time when you're the only Jew in these towns. Um, what do you guys think? Let's start with Annette this time. I don't think it was that the community wouldn't accept more Jews. I think it was that there weren't very many Jews that chose that space for whatever reason, right? And the people that did choose it, my family, your guys' families, were among the minority just because they chose that place, but not because the community wouldn't support more people. I think that the community would have grown and, and been more robust because of it. It just didn't happen organically that way. I agree. Any, anyone else have anything to add? I think we were the only Jews in town because all the others decided to leave. And it wasn't that nobody else could come. <laughs> to, to that point. I, I, um, I, 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 let, let Sally go. Let Sally and then we'll go to Beryl. Um, as, I, as I think I did mention earlier, uh, many parents urged their children to leave. And I remember there was a booklet that can, I think B'nai Brith put out of, that counted up all the Jews at different colleges in the United States. And even though there were many wonderful small liberal arts colleges in the Midwest, um, my parents wouldn't hear of me going to any of them. They, I had to go where there was large Jewish population. Um, Fargo has grown greatly since I lived there. Um, it probably has, I don't know, about 200,000 people now where it was 50,000 people. Forgive me if I got the number wrong, but it's a lot. But it's a much smaller Jewish community, um, even though it's a more diverse community in general. So um, it, it wasn't, it, it's just that Jewish parents wanted their children educated and they, they were afraid if they'd stick around Fargo that they would assimilate. And um, so that's what happened. Yeah, thank you, Sally. Beryl. Well, I think there was a growth in at different points. For example, during World War II, I think there were some things that brought some Jews in um, there. But but I know Aberdeen sh uh, shrank, and it's now just back to where it mon once was at about twenty six thousand. So it's and and they're they're basically four Jews in in Aberdeen at this point where. That, I, I mean, I always had to listen to my brother complain after he got bar mitzvah of getting a phone call on Saturday morning. You know, that we need you for the minion. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but but that was you know something that um, it's 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 like it's invisible now, yeah. and it's, it's people's memories. That's why these kinds of things are really important, I think, to talk about. So Anne Aronson asked, what about experiences with anti-Semitism and bigotry in your small towns? And we covered it a little bit. Does anyone have anything to anything more to add to that? Yes, Ellie. When, when I was a child, maybe in about third grade, um, a swastika was painted on the front door of our synagogue. And it was repainted immediately and all the, you know, the prominent Jewish people got together and, you know, dealt with it, but that's that's the only incident I can recall. Annette? It, well, I had a couple, and I think some of them were really pure ignorance rather than pointed anti-Semitism. Um, you know, kids would carve swastikas into the desks at school, and one of my friends would then carve them into windows instead of swastikas, because once it's carved into the desk, you can't erase it. Um, so some of that stuff wasn't really directed at me. It was just kids doodling and being stupid and <laughs> ignorant. Um, I, I did have an experience. I ran track in middle and high school and somebody was wearing a cross necklace and said, Hey, will you hold this? My race is coming up. Sure. I'll hold it. And someone else came up and asked, you know, isn't that burning you? Doesn't that burn your hand? Mm. What? No. <laughs> like, not. So, but again, not really malicious, just really didn't get it. Um, you know, people would use negative slang about Judaism and not have any real understanding of what that meant. So, you know, Jewing them down, that's so Jewish. And I'd call people on it and they would go, wait, what? I don't get it. And if you'd educate them about it a little bit, they would 
usually, unless they wanted to irritate me on purpose, stop doing that kind of stuff. But I definitely ran into it several times and mostly fueled by ignorance. Hmm. Or it was taught at home. Like when a someone Possibly. your age is riding a bicycle down the street and yells, dirty Jew, it, you know, they heard it somewhere. Right. So it may have come from somewhere less ignorant, but the people that were saying it to me were mostly kids. Exactly. And didn't get the it. Jew you down thing was very not very, but common. And I understood that was ignorance. Yeah. There, there's something that I thought was quite interesting that I hadn't thought about until I sort of started preparing for this session, which is, um, I, to my, in my memory, the Jewish people in Aberdeen only spoke English to each other. They did not speak Yiddish. And, um, and and I and I wonder whether that was kind of a defense mechanism to, to not have people react to hearing something in a language they didn't understand, even though there were people who were speaking other languages um, in the street. But I, I think that was really unusual. Because if I mean if you go to big cities, particularly on the East Coast, there's a lot of Yiddish being spoken. Not so, spoken, but you know, dropped into conversations as yeah. an adjective or a noun. Yeah. yeah. Um, my, my husband from New York would visit Fargo. My mother would sometimes say, I got to schlep these groceries in the house, Rob. Will you help? Rob, do you know what the word schlep means? Um, which got a laugh from him. But um, uh, my parents both grew up in households where Yiddish was spoken, but only my father learned it because the grandfather in the family only spoke Yiddish, but my mother only had the kind of vocabulary that, that I have now. Although I think since I moved to New York, it's expanded about 1700%. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, Paul Solomon has said, uh, I would like to say hello to both Beryl and Sally after a respective 65 and 55 years of no contact. I knew Beryl as a small boy in Aberdeen, South Dakota, and Sally during high school in BBYO. They knew this Paul, Paul Gutman. Oh, I'm my baby <laughs> living in Minnetonka, Minnesota. So Paul Gutman says hello. Yes, his father owned a, a movie theater. <laughs> oh wow! Oh man! And, and oh, and my dear friend Lina Bilar says, "Did you find asks Did you find the dietary habits of your family different from those of your neighbors? And how hard was it to find the food that your family was used to?" Diet. I'm sorry. I'm laughing because my mother's parents are both Jewish, but are not practicing. And so my mother, although grew up in a technically Jewish household, didn't observe anything with Judaism. So my mom has sort of crafted a Jewish home, but we didn't keep kosher at all. So, I mean, we raised all of our own meat, but we didn't find kosher meat. So we had three freezers in the basement for the stuff we'd butchered and my dad would go deer hunting, but we also raised pigs in addition to cattle and stuff. And now as an adult, I'm a vegetarian. So, you know, <laughs> going totally the other direction. So that's why I'm kind of laughing about it. But, you know, there were families in Sioux Falls that would go, I can't remember if it was Sioux City or Omaha. There was somewhere that, where there was access to a kosher butcher and mm -hmm. they would go and they would stock up on things. But because my family was raising all of our own stuff, we didn't bother. There, when my mother came to Aberdeen, she was told by the various people she met that there was a kosher butcher. And so she went there and she, she was waiting in line and she noticed that there was one butcher and one butcher block. Hmm. And, and, um, hmm. and then, and she realized the butcher was using the same block and the same knife to cut the, what he called the kosher meat and the non-kosher meat. Oh, yeah. So she thought, I give up. <laughs> we never kept kosher, but we just didn't have pork in the house. <laughs> Alyssa, um, on holidays, my mother made Jewish food and there's a distinctive kind of Jewish food unique to the Midwest. And it includes Winnipeg, I think, which is, Winnipeg yeah. is 350 miles exactly north of Fargo because one of my closest friends in New York, I met her when I identified her Winnipeg accent at a uh, school <laughs> meeting. And when she does uh, Passover seders, her food tastes like my mom's. It's very different than New York Jewish food, which is more like lox eggs and onions, which 
I never had. But I also think that the influence of the non-Jewish community influenced my parents' child rearing. When, when I would come back from Herzl camp, I'd be all kissy, kissy, kissy with my friends because that's what the, <laughs> the teenagers did at Herzl. I mean, it was very affectionate. And I, my mother actually said, you know, it's, that is not gonna fly in Fargo, Sally. So just stop that right now. And my parents, I, I sometimes say they raised us before self-esteem was invented because they, we were in a very Scandinavian community where there's not a lot of gushiness over um, children. And my parents kind of took on that um, particular effect in terms of raising us. And um, I, I sometimes think if I had been raised by my mother-in-law in New York, that I could have been president of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> and doubt her I had a food follow-up, but I don't want to talk over Bonnie if you had something to say. No, no, no. I question. It occurred to me that holiday food was totally different. So if you wanted to find matzo ball or matzo meal, whatever for holidays, the grocery store couldn't figure out when the Jewish holidays were. No. And so they'd guess based on when they were the year before, or they'd do it over Easter. And sometimes it was close enough before that you could get stuff. And sometimes Passer would be over for two weeks and then there'd be moths on the shelves and no one would buy it. And the supermarket would go, we're not stocking this stuff if you guys won't buy it. And so this was a constant back and forth of, well, if you just like ask us, we'll tell you when to buy it, but you were too late now. And we went somewhere else and figured it out. I remember now now that um, we used to have matzah and potato starch and matzah meal and all of that. Passover shipped by bus from Cecil's Deli in St. Paul on Greyhound to the bus station. And I remember my mother, is there a package for the Dykels there? And it was like, the matzah's coming, the matzah's coming, yes, I get the matzah. And the bus station was in some ragged old hotel and there would be the big box on the desk full of Passover goods that came up on the bus. I remember Cecil. He lived near my grandmother. I mean, the place was was on uh, Cleveland Avenue. Yes, still Highland is. Park. They have the it's best. Still there. Yeah. Well, well you it, you know, we're, the, the the problem in, in my family was with my aunts on my father's side, because they were from Milwaukee, and they had been uh, they were always involved with the settlement house in Milwaukee, which is the settlement cookbook comes cookbook, from. Yes, and and. And Gold of My Ear comes from the settlement house also. Anyway, and they always fought between themselves of who was the best cook. And, and so I think I learned about politics from those ants fighting with one another. <laughs> because, you know, and, and you know, it didn't matter what or what birth order you were in. The younger one got a degree in home economics, so she was supposed to be <laughs> listened to. Well, I remember past. Oh, I'm sorry. Just gonna pass oh, as a kid. We used to wonder, would Elijah know we live here? Is he really <laughs> gonna come? <laughs> Well, ladies and, and all of our listeners, uh, it has been such a treat to have this conversation. Um, we don't have any more questions in the Q&A. There's some interesting comments in the chat that I encourage our panelists to read. And is there any final words that our panelists have before we close off for the afternoon? Sally, I see your mouth moving. Oh, I'm just thinking how when I was the editor of various, when I was the editor of McCall's magazine and worked on other women's magazines and there were many, many Jewish editors, I felt like we kind of got our revenge in terms of fantasizing how Christmas should be and creating all this work for non-Jewish women. And for us, you know, we threw a brisket in the oven and went to a movie and, you know, that was our holiday. It was, it was not a bad experience. I, I will say, you, I know. No. Go ahead, Bonnie. I like Christmas carols. I have to admit it. And I will sometimes even listen to the station just because that is so much a part of my childhood and that season, just hearing that music occasionally, not all season long. But, did, did you go um, caroling? I did. We did go caroling. I did too. I did too. <laughs> <laughs> because that's what, you, that's what you do with your friends. It wasn't a heavy duty religious, you know. It was Girl Scouts actually that we did it. <laughs> I was in Girl Scouts too. Yeah. So I think it was a great, a great experience. It had um, 
an impact on me and who I was. And um, I wouldn't not, I wouldn't change it. I like that I had that experience because it is unusual. It's, it's different. It's made me very different. <laughs> Thank you, Molly. <laughs> Beryl and Annette, any final words? I, I just think this this has really been delightful. And, and, and I, I think there's lots of space for people to talk about what happened in the synagogue because there's, there's lots of great stories, I think, that can come out. There's a book in that barrel. Annette. <laughs> I'm trying to think if I have more to add that people haven't said. I mean, mostly my experience was positive. It's interesting. Growing up, I couldn't wait to leave South Dakota. And then I grew up and now I miss things about South Dakota. Um, but as a kid, this is boring. I'm getting out of here. I wasn't going to go to McAllister. I was going to go to the East Coast where my mother's from. Right. And so I, I think it's, it's interesting to look back on it now. Um, because I think it was actually a largely positive experience. And at the time I didn't appreciate it as much. I think <laughs> the same way. Youth. Yeah. Well, that's I, probably very true. Also, <laughs> I, I, I think also that instead of sort of being sad that there's some, that there is diversity among Judaism, I think that's the soul of Judaism I and, agree. and uh, that, you know, we're just now learning what the Sephardic tradition is about and because we've kind of been bearing it and the Ashkenazi have taken over too much, it's in my view. But, but there's, I've, I've traveled a lot of different places and I've been in fascinating synagogues. And my favorite actually is the mountain Jews in Guba and Azerbaijan, and that's that's really an interesting place, and you just can't believe that. It, it, and, and walking on the street on a Saturday, I saw my grandmother's double. <laughs> well, I, let's close with that Beryl's statement that diversity is the soul of Judaism. Thank you all of you for being here, and we hope to see you again. Thank, Thank you, Eliza. Thank you. Thank you, Eliza.